And now it's looped again. The restrooms are on that side, make a left, then the hard right, all the way to the end. In case of emergency, we need to evacuate. We go out, make a hard right, those exit doors are right there, and we run to the hills. Okay? <laughs> Section I. Or, no, that's F actually. Okay? So, with that said, um, I'd like to begin with this text that came to mind. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2. This is Paul talking. He says, I had to feed you with milk, not with solid food, because you weren't ready for anything stronger, and you're still not ready. Slap, slap, slap. <laughs> well, I believe that this class is ready for a little stronger food. Maybe you even might throw some bones here and there. So, Dr. McVeigh is no stranger to us, as you know. He's, he's got deep roots in this Northwest deep region. Uh, one of his, do his daughter is a pastor in our local conference here. Speaker, author, well-known, president for Walla Walla University for the past 16 years and counting. And so it's a great privilege to have Dr. McVeigh with us uh, expounding on the wisdom of how to wage peace in a warring world. My, oh my. Please, let's bow our heads. Father God, thank you. I pray you. Speak to us. Holy Spirit, move us into action. Be with uh, Dr. McVeigh. Quicken his mind, loosen his tongue. I pray. Amen. Good morning. Thank you for being here today. Good to see you. Uh, now, I'm, I'm going to take a little poll here to start with. So, the options are two. I'm interested in whether you think the world is becoming a more peaceful, generous, and kind place, option number one, or number two, it's becoming more tense, divided, divisive, mean, ornery, and warlike. Okay, now I know this is going to be a tough choice for you. Okay, option number one, you think it's becoming more peaceful. How many of you would raise your hand for that? One or two of you. How many of you think it's becoming a meaner, ornery, or more divided and divisive sort of a place? Okay, yeah, I kind of anticipated that response. Uh, we turn today to do some serious Bible study of Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. Now, it's the ringing conclusion to the epistle to the Ephesians. And Paul, as though he were a general on the battlefield, steps forward to call the church of the living God to arms. Now, that doesn't sound very peaceful, does it? So, our, our task today is to try to understand Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20, and understand it within this context in which we find ourselves of an extremely divided world, nation, and so on. And what does this passage really have to say to us? Does it have to say to us, take up your AK-47s and go to it? Is that, is, is that the message? Or are there, are there other messages that are here for us. So what I'd like to do is uh, I'd like to read the passage together first. Can we do that? And if you would, uh, think about as we read, try to tune into the passage and be ready to respond to this question. What, what struck you as new, odd, troubling, inspiring, in this reading of the passage, right? I mean, you've read this passage many times before, but in, in this reading, what kind of jumps out at you, okay? And let's, let's collect your, your candidates, your answers to that question once we've read the passage. So uh, before we turn to reading the passage, let me tell you that I do not have a study guide today. However, if you would like access to this PowerPoint, you can follow this URL. I've made it shorter for you because the original one was half a page long. 
Okay, so if you go, and I've tested it, and some of you test it for me. If it doesn't work, we'll rework it, but I've, I've, put, I've put this, this PowerPoint presentation there for you, and you can call it up and follow along if you wish, or download it for future reference on whatever the case might be. It is not the same one as I gave yesterday. No, it is a it is a different file and it is a different tiny URL. The first part, of course, tinyurl.com is the same, but what comes next is different. That is a different. Yes, and some of you are doing what some of you did yesterday, which is take a picture of the screen so that you can get at it that way. Question. Okay, it's talking about standing against the wiles of the devil and. Uh, and the way I look at it is that I think the devil is good at deception. And so to stand against deception, we need to be able to detect truth from deception. Okay, good. But we're going to read the passage together first. Okay. And then we're going to collect your, your canon. But that's a good one. We'll, we'll put it at the top of the list. All right, so, so here we go. Uh, can you see that well enough to read it? Is that big enough for you to read off the screen? It's not high enough. Is there anything we can do about that? Uh, there might be something we can do about that. Okay, let's 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 try this. Gerald, can you pick that up? Let me slide it down here and set the chair up there, and then two of us will raise it. need two chairs. Okay. You may need two chairs. Okay. 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 While the engineers are working this out, if any of you wish to wear a mask, we have a couple in the back, okay? Uh, maybe we can push this against the wall. Okay, it's not, it won't touch the table. <laughs> I can't switch it to the screen. No. Not the way it's set up. It's set up through this box, and, okay. and that doesn't have a. That doesn't have. A, I don't. I, yeah. it have a well, we might be able to. If you want to change to the AV, just ask, please. Don't do things like this. Can we change it to the? Yes. All right. If you want to change to something, please ask and don't do this. This is an HR. This is a risk management issue. Well, that's that's my fault. My what do you want to do? Well, obviously you guys want to change the AV, but you don't know how to ask. There you go. Thank you very much. I was trying to imagine what that's going to look like if they're filming this, and uh, that's going to be an interesting beginning to the workshop, isn't it? Please. Folks, when there's about maybe 10 seats left, if more people come in, this next door class has been canceled, we will open the site, okay? Just so, so that you'll know.
<laughs> there you go. Hey, Greg, I think you buy that now. Good to see you. Okay, are you able to see that now? Yes. That was no trouble at all, right? <laughs> Thank you so much for hanging in there with us. All right, you remember what we're doing? Yes. Uh, we are reading the passage together, and then you are going to uh, respond to my question, which will be, what stuck out for you? What jumped out? What did you find troubling, inspiring, interesting that you'd like to point out to us? Okay. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. Hear the word of the Lord. Join me in reading the odd-numbered verses. That just makes you stay awake. All right? Join me in reading the odd-numbered verses. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle, I'm reading the even number verse now, remember? This is, we're now in verse 12, right? For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, <clears throat> and having done all, stand <clears throat> firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. And all the saints said, Amen. Amen. Okay, remember my question. What did you notice this time around? What jumps out at you? Please. The first word, the first verse, <clears throat> be strong in the Lord, in the power of His might. Why, why, did that, why did that particularly move you, this go around? For me, the rest of the, of the uh, portion is significant, it's important, but if I neglect that, then I'm closed for the end. There's a sense in which that first verse is kind of laying out the thesis statement, right? Yeah. Be strong in the Lord, in the Lord, and in power. This is His power, His might. So this isn't about pulling our stuff ourselves up by our own bootstraps and, or our own military sandals. <coughs> with the metaphor here. Uh, this this is about an, an utter dependence on the Lord, Amen. who is all powerful and almighty. Right. Thank you. Someone else. Something that moved you, please. Our job is to stand. Our job is to stand. 
Ah, we're going to talk about that. Because we have to understand that within the context of the, the ancient battlefield. And what does stand mean in the context of the ancient battlefield? And why, the reason the passage is a little tricky, particularly in a divisive world, is that it calls us to do battle. It calls us zealously to join the fight. But it's using that imagery in an interesting way. And we have to be very attentive to that. So you point us to a really important issue. So I'll hand over here, please. Sometimes we're shy. We don't want to proclaim the, 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 the mystery of the gospel boldly. Yeah. We feel inadequate. And this is Paul. I mean, if there's anybody that's been bold to preach the gospel... It's Paul, right? And yet he, in this passage, near life's end, is in prison, incarcerated. He talks, us, talks to us about that in chapter 3 of Ephesians. And he's, he's feeling the need for prayer. And he's feeling the need for some boldness that maybe he doesn't necessarily feel when he gets up every morning. Right? Okay, thank you. Anything else that jumped out at you, please? Paul in Ephesians tends to pile words on top of themselves, use synonyms, you know, and it's, it's a very fulsome style that he's engaging in in Ephesians, a, a worship style. And so he, in praying with all prayer and supplication, he's, you know, it, it, it seems to me, and he's really serious about us interceding and praying before God in the midst of the battle, right? Uh, so, yeah, thank you. That That's... And, and, of course, in the Spirit, praying in the Spirit uh, at all times, with all prayer and something. He's, he's really interested in us participating in, in prayer. Ken. This phrase, mystery of the gospel, yes. is the most interesting phrase to me. Paul uses that at least half a dozen times. Yes. And yes. to him, when you think about, to him, the mystery of the gospel, what a great mystery it was. That transformed him. Yes. And he lives in a time when there were something called mystery religions that were all about secrets. And you went into the, 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 the temple of Mithras and you participated in secret rites and you heard the secrets of Mithraism. And this was a big deal. But for him, the mystery of the gospel is an open secret. It's an open secret, but it's more powerful than any of those mysteries that you'll hear in any of those temples of all of those other deities. It's the mystery of the gospel, the mystery of the good news. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else, please? I, I was noticing it said uh, flaming darts. Yes. And Satan uh, prays on fear. Flaming darts and Satan Praise on fear. Thank you. We're going to touch on the picture of Satan here. It's very interesting. He's portrayed as an archer. And we'll come back to that. Please. Maybe it's not so much about the warfare, you know, that we think of breastplate. But for all the saints, you know, so he puts the saints first to pray for yes. them. Persevere and make supplication for the saints. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And, and it's very important for us in this passage to think about corporate. Uh, Ephesians is a is a an epistle that's all about the church. So. Paul uses a lot of different metaphors for the church. Uh, the church is body of Christ, which he teases out in a number of places, starting at the end of chapter 1, chapter 4. The church is bride, you know, Ephesians chapter 5. <clears throat> the church is temple, Ephesians chapter 2. So he uses these and he develops these metaphors very, rather thoroughly as images for the identity of the church. 
And as we come to the end of the, an epistle that's been all about the church, there are some who read Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 20, many in fact, one could argue most down through the history of Christianity, have read it as an individualized image. It's about me as single, lone, gospel warrior. Is that the case? Or is this a final, grand image of the church as gospel army? You see, so it's very important to think about the issue that you're, you're touching on there. Anything else that comes to mind, please? We should, uh, we should always have the garment of the armor of God. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, so that we will, whatever target, whatever the devil wants to do against us, because we are not against the, the principalities and that. It's only the armor of God who can really protect us from the walls of the devil. Thank you. Yes, and the, and the Greek word that's used for this, oh, the whole it's the whole armor of God, right? And the Greek word is pan, which means all panoplia, the the full the head to toe armor. So it's the it's the full covering uh, of the armor that is underlined here. Uh, yes, thank you. Anything else, please. Thank you. So the passage is really an invitation, isn't it, to, to pull black, back the blinders uh, and, and, and really understand what's going on behind the scenes. So when you read about the Democrats and the Republicans fighting it out, duking it out in Congress, is it possible that behind the scenes there's, there's a grander battle that's working itself out? Is, is, there, is, there, is the real fight elsewhere? Okay, and, uh, and so on. So it, it, it invites us to think about something we Adventists generally call the great controversy or the cosmic conflict, right? And to think about life and ministry and Christian discipleship in the context of that wider frame of the cosmic conflict, doesn't it? What an invitation to do that. Thank you very much. Please. Well, it's a, it's a very curious thing, isn't it? Because if you go back to chapter 2 in Ephesians, um, chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, 7, these are wonder, wonderful passages. So, what happened to Jesus happens to us. Ephesians 2, verse 5. When we were dead in our trespasses and sins, God made us alive together with Christ. So, we were resurrected somehow with Jesus, right? Jesus experienced resurrection. We have experienced a spiritual resurrection from spiritual death. Are you with me? Uh, so we were dead, made us alive, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him. Now, you might think that's resurrection, but I take that to mean ascension. So there's, there's resurrection from the dead, and now there's raised us up, and seated us with him in the heavenly places. So that's exaltation. Do you see how we're following the trajectory of Jesus? We're in some way participating in what happened to him happened to us. And uh, we're, our story is bound up with his story. You, you want to understand God's intentions for you? Just look at the tra trajectory of Jesus' story. Just, just understand what's happening to him. So, you know, death, yes. Resurrection, hallelujah. Uh, ascension, double hallelujah. Exaltation, three hallelujahs. Right? Uh, so what happened? And that happens, back to your question, in the heavenly places. So how is it then that we're in the heavenly places with Christ and that also somehow in the heavenly places are the, are the powers of darkness? 
Uh, that's not a question we'll take up in detail here, but it is a fascinating one. And uh, I, I, have, I have pondered that. And I do have some remarks, but um, I, I think that's, you know, there's, 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 there's good questions that just are so good they need to just remain, the power of the question needs to remain in the room. And that was, that's one of them. <laughs> Anything else? Please. Well, and here's probably where we need to point out something, uh, and that is ver verse 12. For we don't, we don't fight or we don't wrestle with one group, but we do wrestle with another group, right? So who is it that we don't wrestle with? Our fellow human beings. The, the real fight, and I don't think he necessarily means that we never have any contention or, or problems with one another. That's not the point. But what he's saying is this point about, you know, opening up the blinders and seeing the wider conflict. He says, listen, what you've got to under understand, and he might say to us, in your divided world where it seems like everybody's at every everybody else's neck, you've got to understand this. Your real fight, your real problem if you have one, your real issue, your great battle is not with any person, flesh and blood. Okay? If you, if you think that some flesh and blood person is your enemy, you don't understand a fundamental truth about this war we're in. And that is, it's not that human being who's your enemy. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. But we do wrestle, we do have a gripe, we do have a battle, we do have conflict, but it's against whom? The rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly place. That's with whom our battle is, right? Not with each other. And that's fundamental to waging peace in a conflicted world, isn't it? Please, back in the back, the God is love sh uh, hat on his head. John, the unseen realm is more real than the physical realm. And Jesus and Paul and Ellen are trying to open up our understanding that the unseen realm is leading into our spiritual world. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what we need to Thank you. Very helpful. Yep. That's right. Anything else? Thank you very much for reading the passage and beginning to get into it. I, I see your juice is flowing here. You're, 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 moving, you're moving into it. Uh, let, me, let me continue our study by telling you a little story. Okay? In January 2020, Rob Makaira, British ambassador to Iran, attends a vigil in Tehran, the capital of Iran. It is a vigil for passengers on Ukrainian Airlines Flight 752 who died when the aircraft was shot down by Iranian forces. So the British ambassador is attending this vigil being conducted in Tehran, Tehran Iran. That, that vigil morphs into an anti-government protest. And when it does, Mikaira realizes it's probably not the place where the British ambassador to Iran ought to be. And so he threads his way through the streets of Iran's capital toward the British embassy. En route, an international incident occurs. British Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab labels it a flagrant, vi flagrant violation of international law. What happens? Well, Ambassador Makaira is arrested and accused of organizing the anti-government protest. Now, he hadn't done that. He had just been attending the vigil, left when it morphed into an anti-government protest. 
But he's arrested, he's accused of organizing the anti-government protest. The British Foreign Secretary's strongly worded complaint results in the ambassador's release after just an hour of custody. Okay, a little international incident. The moral of the story? To arrest an ambassador is a big deal. Sparks fly, red phones ring, tensions escalate, voices are raised. Why? Because when you arrest an ambassador, you do not just incarcerate a single individual. You dishonor an entire nation and its leader, and you risk reprisal and war, right? To arrest an ambassador is a big deal. Back to Ephesians 6, verses 18 through 20. Notice how Paul understands himself and his role in what's going on. Praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end. Keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me. Pray for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. When Paul, the long incarcerated ambassador of Jesus, requests the prayers of believers in Ephesus, he's imagining a future meeting with the Roman emperor, right? It's coming. He knows it. He knows his appointment is on the calendar. Uh, Nero will be seated on his throne, dressed in regal splendor, symbols of absolute power dripping off of him. Into the ostentation of Nero's judgment hall will step the lonely apostle in the tattered prison garb and his grinding chain. The emperor, flanked by guards in full military dress and attended by obsequious administrative aides, will aim for quick dispatch of this troublesome, eccentric, holy man. Paul frames the scene with dramatic contrast between the apparent, Nero's authority and power, and the real, the authority and power of the risen and exalted Christ. Paul will step into the imperial throne room as the authorized ambassador of the Lord of all things and all time. His appearance and chain aside, Paul will have every right to speak boldly. Announcing the will of Nero's boss, the ascended and exalted Jesus. This will be the last call to client King Nero. A gracious embassy by the Lord Jesus Christ revealing the divine plan for the universe, the gospel. Heaven's red phone, you see, is about to ring. As is sometimes the case... Diplomatic efforts are tied to what's going on on the battlefield. You can see that in the Ukrainian-Russian war right now, right? The peace talks are connected to what's going on on the battlefield. Paul is not only an ambassador in chains, verse 20, but an imprisoned general, leader of the Christian army in Ephesus. As Paul waits to convey heaven's message to Nero, he shares his marching orders for believers in an eve of battle speech. Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 20. Paul's battle speech may be distilled into four simple commands. So if you want a simple way to kind of organize what Paul's saying in this passage... I'm going to suggest that you can do so in four distilled, simple commands. Number one, follow the leader. What's the first simple command? Works in every military organization. Right? All right? Even the Navy, Daryl. Correct? Yes. So follow the leader. Uh, the first distilled command is simply this one. Finally, be strong in the Lord 
and in the strength of his might, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. You've got, if you want to win this fight, you've got to follow the leader. Command number one. As general, Paul conveys the orders of the true commander-in-chief who calls us to battle while promising to be with us in the fight. We are to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Now, as Paul crafts his battle exhortation, he has many examples from the Old Testament on which to draw. Let me give you just one sample. Deuteronomy chapter 20, verses 1 through 4. When you go out to war against your enemies and see horses and chariots and an army larger than your own, you get the picture, right? You shall not be afraid of them. Why? For the Lord your God is with you. Paul picks up that kind of language, doesn't he? What else matters if the Lord is with you in the fight? Does anything else ultimately matter? The, the fact that the enemy's army is bigger? Nothing else, everything else falls into irrelevance. If the Lord is with you in, in the fight. Paul echoes those wor words. Finally, be strong in the Lord. And in the strength of his might. In short, follow the leader. Our divine commander not only blesses us with his presence, but with his panoply, his full armor. For a long time, I assumed that this phrase, the whole armor of God, meant only the full armor which God supplies. So God gives me armor in 42 regular you know, crafts it for me, gives it to me, supplies me with armor for me. But then I discovered something. Paul, in this passage, in Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 20, is borrowing, if you will, from here and there in Scripture. He's refracting passages from the Old Testament. And here he's refracting a passage from Isaiah chapter 59, where God expresses outrage at the injustice and brutality of his own people. The saints sometimes don't treat each other just right. And the Lord gets so upset about this that he sends this message through Isaiah. Their feet run to evil and they are swift to shed innocent blood. And, and God is appalled, chapter 59, verse 7 and verse 16... God is appalled that there is no one to intervene. Nobody's solving this problem of the saints feeding on each other. So what happens? The Lord himself steps in to right the, the situation. And he shows up on the cosmic battlefield as the divine warrior to set things right. And so here comes... Uh, verse 17, right? He put on righteousness like a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in fury as a mantle. Ooh. Look out. <laughs> That's how the Lord solves a they fight among the saints. <laughs> it's quite a passage, isn't it? But for our uh, attention here, I, I would ask you the question, does, does that weaponry sound familiar? Righteousness like a breastplate, a breastplate of righteousness, a helmet of salvation. Any of that sound familiar? Here's the interesting point as you see Paul borrowing from this passage. When he says, put on the full armor of God, he, he, he's saying God does not supply us with some second-rate armor. He provisions us with his own weapons. Right? 
Because in Isaiah 59, 17, this is the stuff the Lord himself is putting on. It is his armor, right? The command put on the whole armor of God means to put on God's own armor. Can you imagine God's weaponry failing? So imagine stepping onto the battlefield and you're equipped with God's own stuff. The tone of this passage is not depressing. It is encouraging and heartening. And this is one of the ways Paul intends to encourage us. God's presence, nothing else really matters, right? And by the way, your weapons come from God's own armory, his own stuff. Assuring your ultimate victory, the church's ultimate victory in this battle. Now, I'm going to do a bit of a, um, a sidebar story here, but, um, but it fits in, in this moment, because it has to do with another piece of the equipment on a similar vein. And that is the helmet of salvation. Okay? The helmet of salvation. Now, let me introduce it with a little story about General George Washington and the Continental Army, all right? So the story goes like this. General Washington knows that his army is outmanned, outgunned, outtrained, and outclassed. He knows this. Nonetheless, he decides to march his ragtag army through the streets of Philadelphia, attempting a show of force. For this strategy to be effective, he needs the Continental Army to look as smart and powerful as possible. So he exhorts them to mind the beat of the fife and drum corps accompanying each brigade, to step smartly and in rhythm, quote, without dancing along or totally disregarding the music as too often has been the case, unquote. <laughs> You see his point. He's wanting the Continental Army to look sharp and smart and strong. He, he wants to give a display of force moving through the streets of Philadelphia. As he imagines the event and the reactions of the citizens of Philadelphia, he gives one more directive that seems a little strange. Each soldier must wear a sprig of greenery in hat or hair. So he says, you know, Grab a piece of greenery from that shrub and weave it into your hair or stick it in your hat. What's up with that? Well, <laughs> maybe it's because it will, it will provide a hint of symmetry for troops who are dressed in a wide array of shabby costumes. So maybe, maybe it's kind of trying to get a little bit of symmetry into the equation. But more important, that green twig is a symbol of victory. Washington wishes to telegraph to the watching citizens of Philadelphia that whatever their deficiencies, uh, his army is a confident one marching before the battle in a victory parade. So it is that on Sunday, August 24, 1777, as the Continental Army tramps, tramps through the streets of Philadelphia, sprig of greenery is woven in every soldier's hair or pinned to his hat. Victory is in the air. Now, nearly 200 years later, there's a New Testament scholar uh, whose name is Marcus Barth. He's the son of the famous German theologian Karl Barth. And in a big two-volume commentary on Ephesians, he offers an interesting suggestion about Paul's command to believers to take the helmet of salvation. I quote, Most likely, he writes, a helmet of victory is in mind because this word soteria, salvation, in the context of military literature, like this battle speech, means not salvation, but victory. Most likely, a helmet of victory is in mind, which is more ornate than a battle helmet and demonstrates that the battle has already been won. So, Marcus Bart says, listen, what, Paul, what Paul's saying here is, go into battle, not with your old beat-up, usual, run-of-the-mill, dodgy-looking battle helmet, 
but grab that ornate, beautiful parade helmet that you usually keep back in the, in the back corner of the barracks in safety for the victory parade. Put that on and go into the fight. Why? Symbol of victory. Victory is in the air. Well, most New Testament scholars who uh, noticed Marcus Barth's comments were not really moved. In fact, most of them asked a question. Did Roman soldiers even have victory helmets? Where did he come up with this idea? We have no archaeological evidence for, for victory helmets. But then in the year 2000 came a fascinating discovery by amateur archaeologists in a pit near Hallerton, England. Okay? And um, fascinating discovery it was. Now, admittedly, when it was first discovered, it didn't look like a whole lot. Right? Just some mud, a little bit of metal mixed in. What appeared to be, at first, a mass of corroded, mud-caked iron turned out to be the remains of a highly decorated Roman military helmet. Uh, those remains became the focus of a massive 11-year-long reconstruction effort, the micro-excavation, stabilization, and reconstruction of hundreds of fragments in a 3D jigsaw puzzle. And if you go to the Harborough Museum now in the heart of England, you can see the helmet on display. And uh, it has been reconstructed. And this helmet comes into view. Uh, an artist's rendering. Here is one of the earpieces. And here's the full display. There it is, Harborough. That would be kind of a usual helmet, and this is the reconstructed parade helmet. Okay? See that? Uh, an artist's rendering shows the Roman victory parade helmet, probably made, this, this one, probably ma manufactured 25 to 50 AD, about the time of Paul, covered with silver sheet and decorated in gold leaf. Ornamented with a, a wreath, it features a goddess on its brow, flanked by animals. On a gilded cheek piece, a Roman emperor rides on horseback with the goddess Victory flying close behind, while a captive cowers beneath the horse's hooves. So, because of this discovery and some others, I might add, uh, the question about Marcus Bart's observation is has been answered rather strongly. Yes, in fact, such, such helmets did exist, parade helmets. If Marcus Barth's suggestion, informed by archaeological discovery, is correct, Paul calls on believers, the ragtag army, which to the human eye is the underdog in the looming fight, he calls upon them to do something really strange. As they enter the fray, they are not to wear the expected beat-up battle helmet, but they are to don the expensive, embellished, pristine, gleaming helmet, usually carefully secured in the barracks awaiting the victory parade. Why? It signals their confidence in their commander-in-chief and the resources he has provided to ensure victory. Right? In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of victory. Take the victory helmet. Take the parade helmet and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Because in advance, before the final victory is won, we are to celebrate the grand triumph to come. Can you say amen to that? Isn't that fascinating? So as you study this imagery that Paul gives us here in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20, he uh, again and again teaches us what, what, what he wants us to know. He wants us to have confidence in, in God. Uh, let me pause there. I've been rat rattling on here for a while and uh, want to give you a chance to ask any question or, or share an observation that's come to you as we've reviewed that. Please.
to fly over a spiritual being and Revelation 12, 11, you pass Jesus for the home of blood sacrifice to be applied over our armor when the enemy we see his blood and not us. Mm. Well, I think this is definitely a passage which Paul intends us to use as the focus of prayer and to ask for this, these grand resources of God's grace that he promises us here in this passage. Uh, he, he, he identifies all of us as saints, as combatants in the great controversy. And uh, this passage, as we, as we bow in prayer around it, over it, repeating it, uh, calls us to battle and calls us to participate in these great resources of God's grace. So, back to simple command, simple distilled command. Number one was follow the leader. Number two, number two, know the foe. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 11 and 12. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Paul's second command, know the foe. Now, in, in battle, it will never do to underestimate the opposing forces. Just, that's not a good thing to do, right? Paul invites... A realistic assessment. While we confront enemy forces on the human plane, our real battle isn't with any human being, flesh and blood. It's with the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Now, he, he accords to these forces titles of power and, and in that way displays a kind of respect for them. There is wary acknowledgement, too, in his description of the devil as a cunning, devious foe. We need God's armor, verse 11, to counter the schemes of the devil, right? So the devil, our enemy, is a scheming, wily foe, correct? Uh, however, Paul also offers subtle contempt for Satan, the evil one. Verse 16, in all circumstance, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Paul portrays the evil one as an archer, a missile thrower, consistently viewed in ancient military literature with contempt. Archers are not respected. They are belittled in ancient military literature. So let me give you just one quotation, and you'll get the flavor of this. Uh, this is from Homer's Iliad, and it's Diomedes, the great warrior, taunting the archer Paris. So here it goes. My apology in advance to all you wonderful ladies in the room. This is not me. I'm quoting... Diomedes, <laughs> familiar, right? You archer, slanderer, proud of your lovely locks. If you were to make trial of me in hostile combat with real weapons and armor, neither your bow nor your thick showered arrows would do you any good at all. I have no more concern than if a woman or a witless child had struck me. <laughs> Well, does, does such a passage show deep respect for the skill of military archers? Or women, <laughs> or women for that matter? No, it, it doesn't. When Paul, in the context of his time, in the context of ancient military literature, when Paul portrays Satan as an archer shooting flaming missiles from afar, he paints him as a coward. The evil one is fearful of close order combat. He trembles to confront Christ's gospel army, well equipped from God's own armory. Obedient to their glorious commander-in-chief, the united force of believers is to be feared, and the evil one does so. Proving himself the coward, he lobs missiles from afar. So then, uh, I see Paul here offering... Oh, there's that Diomedes quote. Yeah, there it is. Uh... I see him offering a nicely balanced portrait. We must not underestimate the foe as though we faced mere flesh and blood. 
rulers, authorities, cosmic powers over this present darkness, spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places, all led by a wildly calculating leader, the evil one, the devil. However, the devil is also a coward and fears direct confrontation with Christ and his church. Trusting in the commander-in-chief, victory is to be expected against this scheming and cowardly foe. Amen. Follow the leader. Know the, know the foe. How many commands are we looking for? Four. So this is number three. Join the army. Join the army. So Paul issues this third command. Join the army. Now, he has, um, he has talked about the church and the powers earlier in Ephesians 3, verse 10. We've mentioned that our passage has usually, down through Christian history, been taken as the description of the individual Christian's battle against evil. However, in chapter 3, verse 10, Paul has the church as a whole engaged with the powers, arguing that through the church... The manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. If you put chapter 3 verse 10 in the context of chapter 6 verses 10 through 20, you would argue that what that means is that as the powers confront the church, as they see the church, as they watch God's unity and peace being illustrated and worked out in the church, they know that God's ultimate plan for the universe, Ephesians 1 verses 9 and 10, to unite everything in Christ is coming to pass and they are doomed. See? So they learn something through the church. They see the manifold wisdom of God expressed through the church and they tremble because they know their time is just about up. You see the point? The church, says Paul, is a well-equipped, united army fighting in the long-running battle of the cosmic conflict. Just as soldiers are to support one another and encourage each other to fight courageously, so believers are called to Christian community and collaboration. That's what they're called to do. Uh, I could turn here to a case study, but let me just ask you to put this in your notes. Philippians is another place in the New Testament another letter of Paul's, where a lot of military imagery is used. And it's used in the context of a church fight. And it's two women leaders in the church that are squabbling. Euodia and Syntyche, once unified members of Paul's missionary team, he talks about them laboring side by side with him in the gospel. And been part of his close evangelistic team. But now they're fighting each other when they should have been fighting alongside each other, they've made a classic strategic blunder, mistaking an ally as an enemy and in the process destroying the unity of Christ's own militia, the church. And Paul calls them on it, big time. Uh, he is not happy with this. So he writes in Philippians, I said I was going to skip this, but I'm not, am I? Uh, <laughs> Philippians 4, verses 2 and 3, Paul writes, I entreat you, Odia, and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion. We don't know who that is, that he's addressing as true companion. But so, someone, right? He's asking someone, uh, a, another leader in the congregation to intervene here. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. On Paul's website under About Us, there are photos of Euodia and Syntyche who are members of his pastor evangelistic team. But they are in conflict. They're bickering. They are fighting together in the wrong sense of that term. Philippians 1, verses 27 and 28. Only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent and hear about you, here he is, he's, he's envisioning the outcome of this fight, right? He's, he's envisioning what he wants to see happen. I will know that you are standing firm, battle language, standing firm in one spirit, striving, battle language, side by side, in the right sense of that term, fighting together, right? Fighting alongside one another in the same cause, you see, with one mind for the faith of the gospel and are, are no way intimidated by your opponents. 
For them this is evidence of their destruction, but of your salvation, and this is God's doing. Be so unified. And he imagines Euodia and Syntyche becoming so unified in their spirit and their outlook that the enemies of the church are frightened by that degree of unity. Isn't that something? What an amazing case study that uh, we were given here in Philippians. Battle language. Paul dares to imagine Euodia and Syntyche fighting with each other in a far different meaning of the phrase. Shoulder to shoulder on the front lines of the great controversy, frightening their opponents by their degree of solidarity, the extreme quality of their unity. Now here I'm tempted to digress. The pandemic, COVID-19, has given us important context in which to gauge how we're doing here. <laughs> yeah, I was afraid I might hear you giggle along with me. Uh, surely we would not let such little controversies as masks or no masks, vaccines or no vaccines, face-to-face -face or virtual trip us up, would we? Would we? Well... The pandemic seems to have left, left us in a nasty fighting mood and we lash out at anyone who interprets the latest CDC directive differently than we do. Uh, we make the same critical Euodia Syntyche mistake labeling our allies as enemies and lashing out at them. Let me, let me repeat. If you identify any human being as the enemy, you don't understand this fight. In doing so, we demonstrate clearly that we are green, untried, inexperienced soldiers capable of battle-busting rookie mistakes as we look toward the great conflicts ahead. We've got to get this one right, folks. Is it your line there, one mind for the faith of the gospel, summing up what you're trying to say? Yes, one mind for the faith of the gospel. That's a good, uh, uh, certainly is a, is a, good, a good summary, a very f helpful summary. Our passage, Ephesians 6, 10 through 20, does not portray a solit solitary lone warrior confronting evil. Instead, it offers another image of the church. It offers a unified army that vigorously and unitedly presses the battle. There is a secret weapon in our passage. Christian camaraderie, community, and esprit de corps. If we have lost that secret weapon, we must bend our energies to recapture it. We won't win this fight without it. Join the army. And the final command, fight to the finish. Fight to the finish. <clears throat> now, the ancient battlefield was a gruesome, horrific place. Uh, and, and I'll only offer you one ancient excerpt to illustrate that. As the two enemy phalanxes move toward each other, the decibel level increases. As they collide, the war cry and the war song, the jostling of equipment on the move, mutates to what ancient author Xenophon called that particular sound, that awful crash, a terrible cacophony of smashed bronze, wood, and flesh. With the collision, huge clouds of dust engulf the battlefield. So the one passage I'll cite comes from an ancient Roman battle account. Quote, the Batavians, Roman troops from Batavia, began to close with the enemy, striking them with the bosses of their shields, stabbing them in the face, and pushing their line uphill. Thereupon, the other cohorts joined with eager rivalry in cutting down all the nearest enemy. Everywhere, there were weapons, corpses, mangled limbs, and blood-soaked earth. Paul is adopting no tame metaphor. This is a high testosterone image of Christian discipleship. He imagines the church's army suiting up and entering the fray, charging forward with full energy to that moment when the two opposing forces clash and crash together and fight in deadly close order combat. The verb to stand used repeatedly in our passage, verses 11, 13, 14, refers to the needed action at that awful moment of impact. 
Paul commands no defensive posture or mere holding action. As general, he conveys the commander's orders for a full, zealous, fight-to-the-finish attack on evil. We should, though. Notice carefully something about Paul's vigorous image of the church militant. Paul guards closely the meaning of his metaphor. He does not intend that we Christian soldiers should take up actual arms or be combative in our relationships within or outside the family of God. He does not mean that. Uh, if you have any question about that, you just need to read a little of the context here. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 31 and 32, I regard as one of the most pathos-filled verse passages in all of Scripture. Uh, it goes like this. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. How much is he willing to have remain in the Christian fellowship? Zip. Be kind to one another. Tender-hearted. Forgiving one another. As God in Christ forgave you. Amen. Can you say hallelujah? Yeah. This, this, all you have to do is read chapters 4 and 5 up, leading up to this passage. Paul, Paul, the last thing Paul intends is that we be combative in our relationships. That's not at all what, what he's about. Within our passage, there's a finely tuned phrase that Paul uses to cleverly guard the meaning of the metaphor. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim. What are you going to proclaim? The gospel of what? Peace. The gospel of peace. The church's role, as someone has termed it, is to wage peace. So Paul uses a vigorous metaphor story, parable about combat, vigorous combat, to describe the church's call to wage peace. In the church's battle, and here I'm borrowing from the broader context of the epistle, the weapons are not M16s and rocket launchers. That, that's, not, that's not the weaponry that Paul talks about. Uh, in, in, in our passage, the church's divinely inspired weapons are truth, righteousness, readiness to proclaim a peace-filled gospel, faith, the assurance of salvation, and the spirit-breathed word of God. The church's battle strategy include, in the immediate context of our passage, spiritual alertness in spirit-based prayer all the time and for every cause, especially prayer for our fellow believers, all the saints, not some of the saints, not the saints we like, all the saints, <laughs> and for bold witness to the gospel, the, to the truth of the gospel. Moving to the wider context of the letter, chapters 4 and 5 particularly, we sample the church's strategies. Humility and gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love, zealous guarding of unity, treasuring those given by the risen Christ to his church. And in the context of Ephesians 4, these would be our lay leaders who are leading out in local congregations, right? Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastor, teachers. Uh, forgiveness. Singing psalms and spiritual songs. Submission to one another. These would be strange weapons and weird strategies for any usual army. But they are just the ticket for the peace-waging army of Christ. <coughs> Second Corinthians chapter 10, verses... Four and five, perhaps Paul himself says it best. For the weapons of our warfare are not merely human, but they have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every proud obstacle raised up against the knowledge of God. And we take every thought captive to obey Christ. Our weapons, the weapons of our warfare, are not merely human. They're not human, human weapons. They are divine ones. Fight to the finish. Fight the good fight of faith until and on what Paul calls that evil day. Okay, so repeat the four commands for me. Number one, follow the leader. Number two, know the foe. Number three, join the army. Number four, Fight to the finish. 
I think that's a reasonable summary of what Paul is trying to communicate to us in this passage, which I will argue is probably the most important passage in the, in the Bible on the theme of the great controversy or the cosmic conflict. Now, you would have some other candidates. I understand that. But I would press my case. Uh, this is really an important central passage for us. So let me pause, see if you have any questions before I tell one last story. Please. Good to see you, sir. Thank you. It, when you started talking about the yes. armor of God mm -hmm. and a scene came to mind back in the time of David when as a young person he went to visit his brothers and he went out to fight Goliath. They put somebody else's armor on. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. And he tried it. Right. But then he refused it, and he took the armor that God had given him. Mm -hmm. Yep. Which which would, didn't look like much. Yeah, a sling and a few stones, right? Yeah. Yeah, it is. That that's that scene is often called to mind as we think about this one. Please. In Ephesians six verse nineteen, when he said. That and for him that words may be given unto him. Yes. Like the supplication for that. That made me think of something that I read about A.T. Jones. Elder A.T. Jones in his public testimony before a committee of the United States Congress in opposition to the proposed Sunday legislation claimed that the sentences that he was to speak were shown to him as if written on a wall. Wow. Given wow. words. Wow. There you go. And, and the scenes would, would have some similarity in the fact that we're talking about appearance before powerful government officials and, and all of that. Fascinating. I had not, not heard that story about A.T. Jones. Yeah. Interesting. Please. Can you explain more concretely about the spiritual force or weakness in the heavenly place in our, in, in our life now? What is it like? Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, it, it, Paul is not, is not saying that these forces don't impact our lives, okay? He's operating in a particular first century context in, in which the citizens of Ephesus were pagans, and, and in, in, in their life as pagans, they were worshipping a variety of deities and powers. Those powers were thought to have control of various things, often time periods. So there was, a, there was a deity over each of the days. And you know that in our current calendar, we've retained that, right? Mm -hmm. So we have Sunday, which is the day of the sun, sun mm -hmm. which in the ancient pagan context, astrological context, the sun is not just regarded as a body that is giving us light and heat. It's, it's regarded as a deity to be worshipped that has power over various things, including the 24-hour period of time called Sunday, right? Monday would be the moon, so on, Thor's, Thursday would be, the, actually it's the Norse god Thor, but we're a movie about that, right? Thor's <laughs> yeah. uh, yeah. day, uh, which was the uh, Roman god Jupiter, I believe. Oh, these were Roman gods. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so these were, these, they lived in a, in a time where they felt that they had to be they, they, first of all, they felt like they were under the forces of fate. And so there really wasn't much you could do about it because the fates would determine things. But nonetheless, you had to try. <laughs> so worshiping the right deity at the right time in the right moment was very important. And so you went through all of this in your life. And, and, and Paul, Paul is basically saying all of that is hogwash. Don't waste your Thursdays on Thor. <laughs> There's somebody called Jesus who is the Lord of all time and all space. Focus your worship and your allegiance on Him. But by talking about these spiritual forces, He's not denying that behind the deities and behind the idols and the idolatry, there, there, there is, He says, a spiritual reality. The devil and his minions, these cosmic forces of evil. 
and they do have an impact on our lives, and that's what creates the, the great controversy of which we're part. So while they have their headquarters in the heavenly places, uh, they do in fact uh, do their dastardly deeds in our midst, and we need to be awake to them. Is that helpful? Okay, thank you. Bear with. Could, could you comment on uh, a, a story I heard from a military person one time? It has to do with standing firm and being unified as a community. He says that in the ancient battle, formation. Shields were not used to protect yourself, but to protect the person standing next to you. Uh, I, can, I can comment, uh, an admiral of the Navy, I'm, I'm hesitant to comment on anything. Uh, <laughs> 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 anything military. <laughs> I, I feel at a strategic disadvantage here. If you're <laughs> but, uh, but yes, the fact was that to the extent that Paul is drawing on Roman military praxis and <coughs> procedures and strategies, he's not talking about the lone warrior. It was only the barbarians on the other side of Hadrian's Wall, for example, the Scots, uh, noting my surname. Uh, it, was, <laughs> it was only those barbarians who know about the lone warrior. Uh, the Roman military uh, machine only knows about one thing, and that's the legion. And when they used their shields, it was in fact to protect not the individual but the group. And particularly when they were under, under siege or they were in siege of some city, they would, they would gather those shields together over themselves and form something called the turtleus, the turtle. Yeah. <laughs> and and they, would, they, would, they would move together, their shields together, you see, and be totally protected. So yeah, this kind of a, a sense is very much the case in, in Roman military praxis. Your, your shield is used in that sense of corporate safety and corporate battle and fighting together in the most effective way possible as a legion, a united legion. Yeah. Is that, that it? Please. I would like to kind of go back to the original question, and I appreciate your reference to COVID and the disagreements about masks and vaccines. But sure. The problem that I see is that no one agrees on the actual reality, the facts on the ground. Right. That when you believe that COVID is a myth, that it doesn't kill anybody, mm -hmm. that it's government overreach to be forced to take mm -hmm. vaccines or, or you can't work or wear a mask or you can't come in, um, or a conspiracy theory at its worst, that doesn't seem like what we're talking about here. And that was my original question. If you don't agree on who, what the enemy is, if you cannot agree on the facts, I understand about our fight as Christians against sin and the devil. But sure. This is inside the Adventist sure. church. I, I understand that. I've, I've uh, participated in that conversation and uh, <laughs> have been the focus of some of the most uh, strident language that I've ever heard in my life. Uh, uh, so I, 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 get the, I get the issue. However, let me, let me try to put it this way. Paul is not trying to solve whether we should treat COVID as a health care crisis or as a religious liberty contest. Now, you, you can argue that it's, you know, Romans 12 or Romans 13 or Revelation 12 and 13. You know, uh, you, you get my point. But th that's not what Paul's trying to help us with, though we do need help on that point, I will grant you. Well, I'm not sure what I thought this class was going to be about. Oh, well, no, well, well, I think ultimately it is. Ultimately, ultimately it is. But where Paul is helping us is by saying, listen. Keep your eyes on the real conflict. However cantankerous that battle gets about masks, no masks, vaccines, no masks, that's, that's not where the real action is. So take a few steps back from that, whatever side you're on. Take a few steps back. Think about what it means that, think about the real challenge, which is being unified with a group of people who have disparate views 
about all of that stuff, but must be unified in the great fight before us, which is the cosmic conflict. And, and, and that's, that's where Paul helps us, right? Ken. My, uh, <clears throat> my father had a little poem that went, to live in love with the saints above, oh, that will be glory. But to live below with the saints I know, now that's a different story. <laughs> <laughs> the, the great, to me, the great mystery of salvation that's talking about it is the fact that you can wage war with peace and love and joy and graciousness and kindness and brotherly love. How is it possible to wage a cosmic conflict with those uh, characteristics? Only, only divinity could possibly. Amen. And that is the great mystery. Yes. Amen. Back to the Philippians story for a moment. Uh, I was studying Philippians in my devotion some time ago, and and I ran across this story about Euodia and Syntyche and the lack of unity and so on. And I, 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 I wrote these troubling words in my journal. It is all too easy to think the squabbles of others are inappropriate, but my own are sanctified. <laughs> In what specific ways do I need to, and I'm quoting a specific commentator here, to abandon the self-righteous indulgence of personal squabbles? Uh, and then I jotted down this prayer. Let me, O Lord, avoid being so myopic that I imagine unity to be a challenge only for others. So, you know, the, the, the question is that we, we the, the humility, gentleness, thinking of others before ourselves, th this stuff really hurts, folks. <laughs> I mean, when, no matter where you are and, and how righteous you think your point of view may be, you've you got to really think about what Paul is calling us to here. And it's, it's fairly profound. It, it's, 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 it's no small task. It's kind of a big deal. Uh, and, and we have to say, let me, O Lord, avoid being so myopic that I imagine unity to be a challenge only for others. And uh, working that out is something, Ken, that will require the Lord's intervention on our, on our, help, on our side. Yeah, please. Yeah, Dr. Uh, Malcolm uh, Maxwell used to say that the Christian life is about loving love and hating hate. Loving love and hating hate. My, my friend and mentor, Malcolm Maxwell. Yes, I can hear him say that. Yep, yep. It, uh, give us that statement again. It says, the Christian life is about loving, love, and hate. The Christian life, this is the way Malcolm would do it, yeah. The Christian life is about loving, love, and hating hate. Is that, is that about right? It's my, Mal my Malcolm Maxwell imitation there. Yes, yes. He was my president for three year, 13 years, yeah. Okay, final story. Oh, please. Anybody else have a son like that? <laughs> yes, I, uh, yeah. Okay, so, you know, I have to go to another place because I say, show me what Jesus did in this situation. Mm hmm. You know? Mm hmm. Show me what Jesus did. He took Peter, told him to put his sword away, and he healed the fear of the soldier that came after the Christ. But I just read this, and back to the COVID thing, whether it's imaginary, whether it's real, whether it's a hoax, I do know prophecy. That is what brought me to the Seventh day Adventist mm. Church. Mm -hmm. And I do know that Ellen White says, just before the second coming of Jesus, Satan will come disguised as Jesus, as a great physician, mm. healing the sick mm. worldwide. Yes. So while we sit here and, and, and go through this, preparing mm -hmm. ourselves for the true second coming of Christ, Satan has a counterfeit that will fool the whole world by the miracles that he performs. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is what COVID's about. Mm. 
It's about great disease around the world that Satan will come and appear to heal. Sure. Uh, but it is possible to uh, believe in the Bible's prophecy that Satan will appear as an angel of light, right. you know, and so on. Yeah. But then haggle about wh wh how that applies in a given set of circumstances, right? Yeah. But, but yeah. We, don't even, we shouldn't, as Christians, even be going there. Hmm. Jesus said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, mm -hmm. and unto God the things that are God. And we are here on this earth to spread the gospel. Mm -hmm. We are not here to get into political debates with right and left, whatever you want to call mm -hmm. it. When these people are fighting about these things, we should be giving the gospel of peace. Well, we certainly need to be able to look behind the scenes, right? Amen. And see a larger uh, tableau of what's going on in the cosmos. Yeah. Okay, final, final story. Uh, this is the story of Deacon John. All right? Final story. Here we go. Looking at our time. We can do this. John Pace is a FedEx finance manager and a deacon at the Germantown Church of Christ in Memphis, Tennessee. As part of his duties as deacon, he manages the computer network at his church. Okay, oh, Kind of an appropriate thing for the deacon to do, don't you think? Given his love for math, John installs a background program on the church's computers, one that automatically searches for as-yet-unknown prime numbers. So, you know, he's responsible for these five or six computers at the church, and he says, hey, these things churn away all the time. I'm going to stick this program on there. In their time when nobody's using them, they're going to be searching for as yet unknown prime numbers, right? He's really into math and had a high school math teacher who particularly inspired him. So that little program churns away for 14 years until on one of those computers, on December 26, 2017, it strikes pay dirt. There are tens of thousands of computers involved in the search, Deacon Pace comments. Looks like a pretty ordinary guy, doesn't he, Gary? Yeah. The odds of one of my computers making a prime number discovery are astronomical. Early in 2017, Deacon Pace was declared the official discoverer of a rare kind of prime number. A Mersenne prime number. It is the 50th and largest ever to be found 23,249,425 digits, a million digits larger than the previous record holder. If you want to get a concrete sense of how big a number this is, it takes, it takes 70 pages of 11 by 17 paper to print out the number in two-point font. That's how big the number is. Now, as, as I read the news story, you know, it's one of those little quirky news stories that kind of gets... Gives you a chance to relax from all that divisive stuff that's going on out there. You know, and you read that little story, and you go, oh, that's cool. I mean, it's just really cool. Uh, but it's the concluding, point, uh, concluding quote from Deacon Pace that catches my attention and brings tears to my eyes. I quote the good deacon. There are two much smaller numbers that I am even prouder of. The 20 years I've served as a deacon at Germantown. God bless the good deacon, right? Amen. And, get this, the 44 gallons, not quarts, not pints, the 44 gallons of blood that I've donated in my life. Paul's ringing conclusion to Ephesians, his battle cry, <clears throat> asks this searching question of us. What's your blood number? As combatants in the great controversy, how much skin do we have in this fight? How much blood are we willing to spill? How eager are we to step to the front lines of the battle and throw everything we have and are into the fight? How ready are we to wage peace in the name of King Jesus? What's your blood number? What's mine? Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we do live in a divided and divisive 
and challenging world. And knowing how to navigate it is a great challenge for us as human beings and as disciples. And we ask you for your wisdom and your guidance and your panoply and your grace and your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for being here. Very good.